Well, we've entered the most wonderful time of the year, Christmas. I love Christmas, and we can't uh, picture a more uh, Christmas-esque scene than the snow that we have received. And so, like it or hate it, uh, it's here, and I love it, and uh, I think it's perfect. Because uh, most of Christmas, and not all of Christmas, is nostalgic, if you think about it. Uh, if you're listening to Christmas songs that were written in the last two decades, then you're a problem. That is, a, that is an issue. We only listen to old stuff. We don't watch new Christmas movies. We watch the old stuff. Everything is about the past. And uh, we look back, we lean in, we, we reflect. And it's a beautiful time for us to reflect on uh, the Christmas is past and the years past and uh, the traditions. I love hearing of Christmas traditions and, and starting traditions is hard, but as we lean into them and keep them going, it becomes uh, nostalgic for us. And one of the things I've noted is that Christmas is so nostalgic and, and, and reflective, and Advent ends up being a reflection of the past. But the beautiful thing about the season of Advent is that it's not just a reflection of the past. But it's actually an anticipation of the future as well. Where Christmas is uh, most certainly all about the past, Advent steps in, reminds us of the beauty of our past, but it gives us a hope for future. Advent, uh, by definition, means the coming, but it also means the arrival. And there's this beautiful sort of uh, tension that we walk with over the next four weeks as we lead up to Christmas Day, where we understand that Christ has come but also he's coming. We understand what he's done, but also he's still in the process of doing. And so we cling to this hope, and we light candles for Advent season, reminding us that Jesus is the light of the world. And then he enters into dark spaces, and he brings light. And so each week, if you're not familiar with the Advent season, uh, we light these candles. There's uh, hope and love and joy and peace. And then Christmas Eve, we light uh, the center candle, which represents Jesus. And so what Advent is not is it's not Christmas. It's the anticipation of Christmas. Christmas is bigger than just one day. It's way bigger than one day. In fact, in the liturgical calendar, church calendar, uh, the Christmas season lasts several weeks after Christmas. Uh, but here we lean heavy into Advent as a way to prepare our hearts, to prepare our minds for uh, the arrival of Jesus as well as the coming of Jesus. And the purpose of Advent is really to shift our focus. It's less about consumerism, and, and, and it shifts the entire season of celebrating the birth of Jesus, uh, which is the first advent. The second advent is this uh, coming, but the reality is we're people in waiting. All of us are. We're people in waiting. If you're a female and you've had uh, a baby, you know there's that anticipation of waiting. If you're the husband, the waiting was easier. You still waited, but it was a lot easier, but you waited. We wait for things. We're used to waiting for things, but we don't like to wait long. We like the timetable to be shortened. And yet the reality when it comes to Christ and his work in our lives and in our church and our homes, the waiting period can sometimes be lengthy. And as we light candles and we're reminded of the various things that Christ does and he uh, brings into our hearts and our lives, he brings those into the waiting. And the theme this morning is also, I think, the theme... Um, for our lives throughout the coming year is hope. Every one of us want hope. We need hope, we cling to hope, but all of us misappropriate hope. Hope is not wishful thinking. Wishful thinking often leans heavy on what we want. I wish things would be different. I wish the economy would change. I wish this would happen. I wish this season would be easier. I wish we didn't have snow. I wish we had more snow. Wish most often is uh, grooted and grounded into what we want. It's often selfish thinking. Uh, hope, though, is based on what God can do. Hope is based on what we expect God to do. Wishing is something we all do. It projects what we want onto things. But hope is desiring what God is going to do Anxiously awaiting what he does and when he does it, wishing grows our egos while hope grows our faith. What I want for us in this season of Advent is our faith to grow. It's not just a mad dash towards Christmas Day, making sure you get all the right gifts and you didn't forget anybody. But in the process of this season, our faith can grow. It can be uh, stretched and, and you and I can lean heavier into hope. Wishing is largely based on the environment that we're in is largely based on the season that we're in. The things that I wished for 10 years ago, 20 years ago, are very different than the things that I wish for now. But our hope doesn't change. Our hope is in Christ. 
And it doesn't change. It's everlasting and it's forever uh, and consistent. And we look to the scriptures to see what God has done. And we're able to build our hope based on what God has done through scripture. But the other thing we can do is look to scripture to see what it says God is going to do. Uh, I love leaning into the promises of God. Uh, at some point we may do an entire uh, couple of weeks just leaning into God's promises. What does he promise that he will do? But the scriptures tell us what he has done, but they tell us what he is going to do as well. And in Isaiah 9, which is uh, a very Christmas-centric passage, we understand this passage to be a prophecy. It's telling for the future. This is what's going to happen. And Isaiah 9, 6 says, For a child will be born for us. A a son, rather, will be given to us. And the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And as we read this passage, it gives us a little bit of hope. In fact, this prophecy about the coming of Jesus was foretold to build hope, to create expectations. And if you've ever celebrated Christmas or you've ever been to church at any point in your life ever, you realize this prophecy comes true. Jesus came. They said he's coming and he shows up. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace is coming, and we know today he has uh, come. He's been born. But what we forget is that the early readers of this text wouldn't see the prophecy fulfilled in their lifetime. And in fact, in many lifetimes, many believe 600 to 700 years pass between the prophecy of Jesus coming and the arrival of Jesus. There's waiting, there's anticipation, and throughout the Old Testament, the people of Israel found themselves in captivity to power-hungry, evil kings and, and, and rulers, and they were completely uh, repressed and, and, and oppressed over and over for hundreds of years, and they kept reading this passage saying, someone's coming, Jesus is coming. He's going to be the Prince of Peace. He's going to be Mighty God. He's going to come in power and grandeur. He's coming and their hopes would be built and they would get excited and then time would pass. Generations would go by and they wouldn't see the prophecy fulfilled. I imagine people would gain hope and lose hope and get excited and lose excitement and and they would constantly be in this state of uh, of wanting and having hope and losing hope and needing to build hope again. And and I would imagine they would reread over and over Isaiah's prophecy, someone's coming, Christ is coming, Prince of Peace is coming. And yet what I realized in both the scriptures but more intimately in my own life is that hope doesn't always yield an immediate result. And I think that's the disappointment that a lot of us have felt, but I think many of us even feel now, is where's God? Where's he at? We've asked him to do something, we've desired, we've hoped, we've we've prayed, we've read scripture, we've just really thrown it all on the line. God, this is what I need you to do, and then he doesn't do it in the time that we ask him to do it, or when we think it needs to be done, and then we lose hope again. We move into despair, frustration whether it's finances or relationships or jobs or whatever that looks like, we place our hope that God is going to move in a mighty way and we don't see it and we get disappointed. Hope doesn't always yield immediate results. And the scriptures remind us that over 700 years they waited. People were losing hope everywhere because God doesn't give us a timeline. And you and I have the advantage of reading this prophecy and going, yeah, it happens, and we sing songs about it, and they make movies about it, and we celebrate it once a year, even though it really wasn't in the wintertime on Christmas Day. Like, Jesus' birthday wasn't really December 25th, but we celebrate it there, and it's fine. And, and so we know it's happened, and we lose sight of how important it is that they waited. There was this longing, this tension, this, uh, this in-between liminal space that people were living with hoping and and needing God to come through, but constantly being drawn back into hope in Christ and then losing hope and being drawn back into hope. But we're all much the same way. And in the process of losing hope and being in despair and then hoping again, our faith begins to grow. When we place our hope in other things and it lets us down, faith doesn't grow. When we place our hope in Christ, our faith grows. And as humans, we are the only ones that have the capacity to lose hope. Have you thought about this? 
We're the only ones that can lose hope because we're the only ones that were created with the ability to have hope. So if we have the ability to hope and we can lose hope, we can build hope again. We can gain hope again. We can lose it because we had the opportunity to have it. If you have the capacity for hope, then you have the potential for hope again. And that's what I want this season to be about for all of us. So place our hopes back in Christ again. It's not in a political system. It's not in a country or nation. It's not in a flag or uh, it's not in an economy. It's not in a currency, even though Bitcoin's doing well, I hear. It's not in any of it. Our hope is built in Christ. And so we reapply, we realign our hope to uh, ensure that it's not placed in anything other than Christ. And if we fast forward six, maybe 700 years, we find in the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 126, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth. To a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David, the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, Rejoice, favored woman, the Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of a greeting this could be. Then the angel told her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. In this verse that you've undoubtedly heard uh, many times, generally in this season, uh, it describes a young, unmarried uh, Mary. We see her to be maybe 12 to 14 uh, years of age, and an angel appears, and she's immediately afraid. It says she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of a greeting this could be. And immediately she began to fear, and, and not that necessarily that there was an angel in front of her, though that was a possibility. There was uh, cultural standards for men and women to uh, have conversations and enclosed spaces alone. And so there's a possibility there were elements of that. But the scriptures describe, more importantly, that she was wondering what kind of a greeting this could be. What is the angel going to say? What is going to happen? Undoubtedly, she was uh, familiar with uh, some of the scriptures and stories uh, of past. She uh, probably knew of uh, the Garden of Eden and, and what God was doing there. She probably knew of Moses and the burning bush. It's possible she knew of Gideon and the angel telling him to defeat uh, the foreign invasion. And so she probably heard stories and read stories of what kind of greetings these could be. And so when she saw the angel, she probably drew from past experiences and nostalgia. What's this going to look like for me? How is this going to shape and change my life? And the angel quickly said, don't fear. Because the enemy of hope is fear. And when a lot of us operate and move out of fear, we aren't able to hold on to hope. We can hold on to fear. We can hold on to hope. Fear, in many ways, is a lot easier because fear is often based on what we are afraid is going to happen, while hope is based on what God is going to do. A lot of us cling more to fear than we do hope because fear is a whole lot like wishful thinking. It's rooted and grounded in our own uh, desires. Even though fear is what we don't want, we often project it onto the future. And so there's this tension, but we can't have hope and fear at the same time. The more hope we have, the less fear begins to take over in our lives. So if you desire to cling to hope, know that hope is exciting. There's something really exciting about having hope and holding on to hope and uh, walking in hope. There's something exciting about it. We begin to see the excitement build and begin to see uh, hope spread. And in verse 31, now listen, the angel said, you will conceive and give birth to a son. You will call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Here in this moment, we see there's a sense of excitement and expectancy and urgency around the day. This prophecy that we've been holding on to for hundreds of years, Mary in this moment is the only person to know that it's coming to fruition. There's something exciting about it. Christmas is not the story of the birth of a spiritual guru who came to spread news and special knowledge for the journey towards self-actualization. Christmas is the story of the one who came to liberate creation from the bondage of sin and death. Jesus came to save us. And we don't just celebrate a baby in a manger. We celebrate the coming of the eternal immortal, all-knowing, ever-present God of the universe who will ultimately deliver us from the evils of this world. And we should be excited about that. 
that should elate us. That should get us motivated and, and move us towards excitement. And sometimes we hear this information and we just sit on it and we go, yeah, I've heard it many, many times. We're often guilty of being uh, too associated with this news, but there should be something exciting happening inside of us this season. We we're celebrating the birth of the one who came to save us from hell, death, and the grave. We get excited over this season for many reasons, but we should be excited that Christ has come for us. Hope is exciting. And we see this in every area of our life when we get our hopes built up, things start to shift. We saw the economy shift almost immediately. Stock prices are going up and things start shifting. All because a change of presidency, good or bad, like it or hate it, the shift and change created hope, which had uh, long-term ramifications. It started to see the ripple effects everywhere. How much greater do you think the hope of Jesus Christ in our world should change and shape society at large? The ripple effects of who Jesus is and what he came to do should be felt far and wide. And you and I, we're the part of that process. We're the ones who are helping that ripple effect take place. And sometimes we get excited for something to happen. And what happens is we just sit and we wait for it. We're just going to wait. Just going to sit around. But Advent isn't the kind of waiting where apathy and boredom and despair settle in. We wait knowing something significant about the future. You and I know Jesus has come, but we also know he's coming again. We have this news. We have this information. We know that Christ is coming again. And so we can set on this information or we can spread it. That God has called us, though, to keep busy while we wait. And we don't know how long we're going to wait. And anyone who claims to know is not, not accurate. They're not true. It's a false prophet. We, we don't know. The Bible says we're not going to know the seasons and the times. Jesus is coming. We don't know when, but we know he's coming. And some say, well, the, all the signs are pointing towards soon. Maybe. Some say, well, it doesn't look like he's coming anytime soon. Maybe. We don't know. We just know from the moment Jesus left earth to this moment, people have been expecting him to come back any minute and I think our generation has lost the urgency of what it looks like to wait on Christ, but to tell others Jesus is coming. I mean, I know I rarely think about the return of Christ. I think about getting my tires rotated. You got to do that all the time. I think about my oil change. Every mile is like one mile closer to having my oil changed again. I just changed my air filters. I forgot about that, but I remembered now. I have a note, a reminder in my calendar. I just don't think about Jesus coming back. I mean, when was the last time you thought about Jesus returning to earth? It's kind of weird to think about, isn't it? This is a little odd to think someone may, you know, is he going to float down? Is he going to appear? Is he going to fly down? The Bible tells us pretty, pretty accurately that he's going to uh, be here and we're going to see it and uh, graves are going to open. Like things are going to happen. It's going to be odd and strange. And, and I think because it's so obscure, we don't really even talk about it or contemplate. But because we don't really think about it, talk about it, or contemplate it, we don't really tell others about it either. And it's kind of an odd thing to tell people. Hey, Jesus is coming back. He's living in the sky. He's going to come back for us, and we're going to go meet him in the sky, and, and we're going to spend eternity in heaven. And it's kind of a, an odd thing to share, but at the same time, if we're not telling people, how are they going to know? And I think in our waiting, we became apathetic. And one of our purposes here is evangelism. But honestly, evangelism in plain speak is not sitting around, not wasting time, not ignoring the uh, beautiful things that we're called to do through Scripture that God has called us to keep busy while we wait. What does it look like for us to tell people Jesus is coming again? This is the first Advent. We're celebrating this. We have another Advent coming. This is our responsibility. You and I stand between God and humanity. We have responsibility and an opportunity. And as a church, we must position ourselves in a way that we are telling people about the hope that we have in Christ. Not just here and now, though that is absolutely necessary. But we have hope for a future with him. We have the news. We have the exact same news Mary did. Have you thought about that? Mary was told Jesus was coming. We've been told the same thing. Jesus is coming and hope is active. Hope says, I hope people give their lives to Christ. I hope people come to the knowledge of who Jesus is. But I'm going to make sure that I'm actively a part of the process of telling everyone about Christ. I'm not going to sit around and wait for others to do it. But I'm going to be actively involved in spreading the message of Jesus Christ. Hope is active. It's the action that we take to make sure things are better. We don't just have hope in Christ, though we have hope in Christ's mission. 
It's not just Christ who's coming, but he's given us something to do. And we believe in his mission. The mission of God is to, to, to seek and to save the lost, to bring them in, to baptize them, and to disciple them. And we all have a responsibility to do this, though not all of us walk in that. And though we've talked about our gifts, and some of us have the gift of evangelism, so it becomes easier, we all have the responsibility of evangelism. Not all of us are gifted in it, but God blesses us, and he gives us the ability to, but we have the responsibility to step into this, actively doing what God has called us to do. And that should be exciting for us. That should build excitement in our church, whether it's here in Evansville or North or South America or the world. We have a responsibility to tell people of the coming of Jesus Christ, and that's exciting. The second thing is hope is everlasting. Everything we place our hope in comes and goes. It builds and it drops and it uh, is exciting and then it's not and we, we gain hope in it and, and expectation and then we lose it. That hope is everlasting. Hope is forever. It's not just momentary. Hope is forever. It's not just in the here and now. And in verse 33 it says, he, speaking of Jesus, will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom, it will have no end. You and I, if we align our lives with Christ and we accept and adopt his mission and we invite other people to believe in Jesus, are actually inviting people into something eternal. We're not inviting them into something momentary. It's not a four-year position. It's not an eight-year seat. It's not another thing that comes and goes. It is eternal. And we don't just have hope while we're here on earth. We have hope that Jesus will return for us again one day, that there is more to come, that this is not the end. And I so often get caught up in the here and now because life is hard, really hard. Uh, just over the, the week, I, I had multiple texts from various people struggling in different ways, and we had our own things going, and, and I just, in my head, I had a moment where I just paused and went, life is just hard. And it's beautiful, too. We had beautiful moments and, and meals, and I ate way, way too much, and uh, I plan to eat a lot more today, and I'm not done eating, but uh, life's hard. And it's hard in such a way that it causes us to keep focused on here and now. You feel yourself do that. We get caught up in like, this is it. This is everything. Our attitudes, our emotions, and everything get caught up in the reality that, that this is it for us. And we need everything to be right and perfect and good. And, and so we fight so hard to create moments and, and, and our expectations to be mad and everything's perfect. And, and life is hard. People are sick and dying. And, and things are difficult. And finances are challenging. And on and on. Relationships are strained. Things are hard. And they're so hard that we get caught up here that we forget that this is not the end. And in some ways, this is kind of just the appetizer. This is just the beginning. We have hope that we will be with Jesus in eternity. Our hope is not just that Jesus came and died for us, but that he'll rescue us. He'll take us to heaven. We'll be with him in eternity. The issue we have with hope is that it implores us to be patient. Active patience. Active patience is challenging. Hope in God is to be patient with God. To know that he's working things out even when we can't see it. The story isn't done, though. He's not done writing our story. He's not done working on us and in us. And, and so we have to believe that there's something still yet to be revealed. This is not it. And as hard as things get and as challenging as things are and as exciting as things are as well, things aren't always hard. We still have to maintain the posture that this is not the end. God is not done. And I think a lot of our anxiety comes from our inability to be patient with God. We want what we want when we want it, and we mistake not yet for never. We don't see what we ask for, and so we think we'll never see it. We mistake not yet for never, and God's promises, they come true in his time. And so we have to trust that he is good. The real issue is that we're settling for the immediate many times over the eternal. We're settling and content with the immediate, and we're losing sight of the eternal. Not everyone has everlasting hope, and so we have to spread it. We have to share it. We have to tell others about the everlasting hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Despair is op the opposite of hope. So as we settle into despair, we can't juggle despair and hope at the same time. We will always drop one over the other, and so despair by definition is the complete loss of hope. But as long as we maintain uh, a trust in Jesus, we always have something to be hopeful for. And if this is you, and you've held on to hope, and you've been let down, 
I invite you, I implore you to trust in God, to put your hope in him, and then share that hope with others, that our lives are often mapped by our hopes. The ceiling of our life is often our hope. If it's in something monetary or momentary, it's always going to limit us. When we place it in something everlasting, then the ceiling is taken off. Our lives end up being uh, lived at a much grander level. The map is long, but it leads us somewhere. If you'll keep your hope in Jesus, it's taking us somewhere. Everlasting hope found in Christ. Last thing is hope is available. I think a lot of us don't necessarily live with the mentality that we actually do have hope available to us in Christ. Some of us are like, yeah, it's a good story. Maybe it's just a way to pacify anxiety. Uh, Some of us find Christ to just be uh, nostalgic. You grew up that way. Uh, Whatever. Not all of us live with the reality that hope is available to us both here and now and in eternity. And if we lean into uh, Mary as an individual, she's this teenager, carefree, and living her life, and the Holy Spirit comes upon her and says, uh, guess what, surprise, you're, you're going to have a baby. It's not just any baby, but uh, you're going to have the hope of the world inside of you. You don't have to worry about coming up with a name, but you're actually going to carry the hope of the world. And, and here in this moment, I would imagine there's, there's a lot happening. And Mary responds. She asked the angel, how can this be since I haven't been with a man? The angel replied to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power from the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. I would imagine Mary just going, okay, Sure. The beautiful thing about the picture of Mary is that Mary is a picture of how the gospel works. Mary didn't achieve anything, she didn't receive, and yet she received everything. She didn't work or earn this, it was just placed upon her. She received the grace of God in the form of spiritual pregnancy, and Mary found favor with God. We do not earn or work for the gift of salvation, and yet we receive it. God comes upon us, gives us the gift, and we receive it. The opening act of Jesus' story is meant to remind us of the beginning. When God created heaven and earth, he creates something beautiful in Mary. He's creating something beautiful in us. With Mary, we see a picture of God's creative work happening all over again. And you and I, we've received Jesus, just as Mary has. And yet, we now have the responsibility to share Jesus. That hope can be confused with faith many times, but faith is the substance of the things that we hope for. So once again, our Faith is now mapped by what we hope for. If our hopes are limited, our faith is low. Faith is the substance of things that we hope for. So can we hope greater? Watching our faith begin to expand. Our faith is closely connected to the things that we hope in. Is our hope in Christ? Psalm 71 says, but I will hope continually and praise you more and more. Can we walk with this posture, you and I? Not just through the season, not just through the remainder of the year, but can we walk with a posture of hoping continually? I would imagine it's just a a refresh. I have to refresh my computer periodically. It's a refresh of just, I'm hoped, hoped, hope, refresh, hope, hope, hope. We hope continually. And in the process, we praise more and more. There's active patience. There's active hope. There's active waiting. On paper, it doesn't make sense, but when God is involved, It always works. And I lose sight of that so often and I get so frustrated and and I move into despair. And yet, when passages like this come up, they remind me that God's not done. It's a not yet. It's not a never. And and this holiday season, I want us to look to the future borrowing from the past. We can look at what God has done and we can look with anticipation of what he's going to do. He's been faithful in the past. So he'll be faithful in the future. There's hope. This is waiting, knowing that you are waiting on God who comes through exponentially. So some of us are in a situation, and we need God. In fact, I would argue that all of us are, have some situation somewhere where we need God to move. Some of us, it's greater than others. Some of us, more emergent than others. But all of us need God to work and operate in some capacity. The question is, are we willing to put our hope in Christ and wait? Actively waiting. Maybe you're here and you're in despair. Maybe you've given up. Maybe you've quit hoping. Maybe you're going through the motions. It's very easy to do. I've done it many, many, many times for uh, really long periods of time. When you just go through the motions, if you've been in church long enough, you know how to fake it. 
You know how to pretend. You know how to just do what you know you're supposed to do because you know you're supposed to do it. You may not believe it. You may not have hope in it anymore, but you know you're supposed to do it, so you just keep doing it. But that's not exciting. That's not how God has called us to live. There's more. There's better. He wants to reignite our hope in him, our trust and our faith in him. He wants to begin to expand and enlarge our territories, our lives, our influence. There's more to life than merely getting by, struggling through, and just hoping to make heaven one day. There's so much more that God wants to do in our lives, and maybe you don't have hope. Draw from someone else's. Draw from mine. Pull from the people in community. Some of us, we have a lot of hope, and you can lend it out to others. Trust that God is good. You may not believe that, but believe that someone near you who you love believes it, and we can move forward together because God puts us in community for a reason. Sometimes we have to share hope together. Sometimes we have to lock arms and say, well, I've got a little more hope than you do. I'm going to translate that to you, and we're going to move forward together. But what I need you to know before we leave is that Christ is for us, and he's with us. And if we'll trust him with our lives, we'll see that this season of uh, this couple of weeks leading up to Christmas becomes a beautiful season of no rush and hurry and consumerism, but an actual time for us to pause and reflect, find solitude and peace, and ask God to meet us in the waiting. God wants to meet you in the waiting, whatever you're waiting for. Whether you're waiting for Christmas or you're waiting for a miracle, God wants to meet you in the waiting. He's there in the waiting. If you would bow your head and close your eyes this morning.